we have these memories in our lives that are so important and we can almost always remember what we wear you know and when we stop and we respect that that those clothes are part of the memory then we want to take care of them and hold on to them welcome to flip your script the podcast about life's critical turning points and how people find the inspiration and motivation to move forward and rewrite their unique stories. Flip Your Script is produced by Media Minefield, a public relations firm passionate about the power of sharing stories. Specializing in earned and social media, Media Minefield helps clients take control of their unique story and message. The show is hosted by Christy Peel, founder and CEO of Media Minefield, who flipped her script from an Emmy-winning journalist to a successful entrepreneur and speaker. A recent study showed there's a three-way tie for Americans' least favorite chore, doing the dishes, wiping down the bathroom, and doing laundry. Now that's most Americans. There is one man who's working to flip the script on how we all think about that hated chore, laundry. Patrick Richardson is an author, fashion fan, and the host of HGTV's The Laundry Guy. Welcome to the Flip Your Script podcast. Thanks. Thank you so much for having me. This is super fun. So did you know about that study that people, I'm sure people tell you all the time, I hate doing the laundry, but does that surprise you? It's there with like wiping down toilets? I didn't know the study. Sadly, it doesn't surprise me because people all the time tell me, oh my gosh, I hate doing laundry. And I just think that's the, I think that's just the weirdest. Although quite frankly, I mean, do I think that wiping down the bathroom or doing the dishes is awful? No. I mean, I can think of so, so many things that I would would hate much more than any of those. Because in general, you like cleanliness. Well, yes, I do. Um, I do for what, I mean, I do for a number of reasons, but one of the big ones is, you know, I believe that you do these things for somebody that you care about. You know, I mean, I always say you do laundry for people that you love. So, to me, doing the laundry or cleaning the bathroom or washing the dishes, I mean, that's kind of a love language. It's, you know, if you're washing the dishes, it's because you made somebody a meal, you know, probably, or because you left them from the day before. But either way, at some point in time, someone that was important to you had a meal, you know, and that's how I feel about doing the laundry. And beyond that, I actually had a customer say to me once, and I think that she summed it up better than I can. She said, you know, at the end of the week, I can do all the laundry and I can look at it. But at the end of the week, I can't look at that big pile of social work that I did. So I think that there's something really satisfying about being able to do a chore and complete it. So I think that's probably why I like all of those things. And to your point, there's something very satisfying about being able to go to a loved one and say, here, all of your laundry is clean. I did this for you. It's it's an act of service. Right. It's totally an act of service. And if you have children, young children, let's say, you know, they can't do their laundry. And the truth of the matter is, if you didn't wash their clothes every single time, like if they left the house with stains on their shirt, they won't die. Like that won't kill them. So you do it because you love them and you want them to feel as good as they possibly can. Not because you have to, you don't have to. I mean, I have all these things that I say, I guess I didn't realize it until just now, but I always say you don't have to do laundry. You get to do laundry and you get to take care of the people that are important to you, which means that you have people that are important to you. Even if the person that's important to you is yourself, you know, you give some importance to whomever you do the laundry for because you make them feel better about themselves because they look better. Do you know how thrilled the majority of the world would be if all they had to do was throw their clothes in the washing machine? I just got a picture from someone, and this is now, who lives in Colombia. His mom lives in Colombia, actually, and he sent me a picture of her wash basin, which was a basin with like a washboard on the side. And that's how she does her family's laundry. So, you know, really, we have it pretty good. And when we stop and look at the fact that we have it pretty good, you know, it becomes a lot easier. Even just the fact that we can push a button for most Americans and water just comes into a machine. We don't have to clean it. We don't have to boil it. Just the fact of getting clean water in a lot of the world is something that takes work. It's a whole day event to just 
get a load done, much less you can do a, many, many families loads in modern day machines in one day. Right. And, you know, that's I mean, even my grandmother used a ringer washer, which took the hours. And she thought that was so incredible because that was so much better than washing them in the sink. So really, you know, I mean, I have that attitude about laundry. I have that kind of, you know, kind of this attitude of gratitude about laundry. But I also just like it. You know, I like the challenge and I like great clothes and I like wearing great clothes. And I just really think that if you decide it's fun, it's fun. So when you talk about my book or you talk about the, you know, the laundry guy on Discovery Plus, I hope that the thing that comes through with both of those is that it's fun because it is. You have a store at the Mall of America. You have been quoted in many, many major publications. I watched an interview with you on Good Morning America. You're now the laundry expert. And when I was doing research and reading about where this started for you, because obviously it started somewhere, very few people wake up one day and go, you know what? I am going to be the laundry expert. Today is the day I'm choosing to be that. It For you, it started, you mentioned your grandmother earlier, but talk about the memories you have of doing laundry with her. I just think it's such a beautiful memory because most of us have, you know, whether it's hanging clothes on a clothespin or you talked about the wringing out of the laundry, it's a bonding thing for a lot of people. I mean, any household chore is a bonding thing, right? But I loved doing laundry when I was little. I was fascinated by the washing machine when I was very young. And when I was probably two and a half, and I know that I was either 18 months or two and a half because it was summer, I remember handing clothespins to my granny when she put clothes on the clothesline. And what there's a couple of things about that are funny. I only recently realized she had to hand me the clothespins to hand back to her because I couldn't reach them. (laughs) And, you know, that is a grandmother's love, if nothing else, right? But then the other thing, the reason I know it was either 18 months or two and a half is because it was summer and my birthday's in November. And when I turned three, Santa brought me a washing machine for Christmas, like a toy washing machine. So I know that my love of laundry went back far enough that, you know, Santa knew that it was a good idea to get me a washing machine when I turned three. So, you know, I have those memories with her and, you know, I have both, actually, I have memories of doing laundry with both of my grandmothers, which... I'm super lucky that I had them both and that they were both so incredibly doting. But, you know, those memories kind of, I mean, they, they go through my life and, you know, even now when unfortunately I don't have either of them anymore, you know, it kind of comes back to me when I do the laundry or when I talk to you, I think about, you know, clothespins and just kind of what they went through and how easy it is now compared to kind of when they were children and when they started and, you know, it just kind of, it all comes full circle to me. And that's the reason I think that I associate laundry with love because the people who loved me the most, I did laundry with them. And in other things that you've said, and I, again, had never thought about it this way, you've flipped my script. I'm going to do laundry very differently. And next time I do it for my smelly teenage boys, which is a whole extra set of love when they're in sports. But you talk about how clothes our stories and we have stories embedded in our clothes and how important clothes are to stories. Talk about that because that's a fascinating way to think about apparel. Well, I mean, the, uh, the very best example of that, and there's one example that goes above all else is wedding dress. We have this idea of, you know, I mean, little girls tell me when they're little, you know, I'm going to have a big wedding and I'm going to, you know, and it's going to be a big fluffy dress and whatever. And we hold on to that you know, women hold on to that dress forever. I mean, sometimes they hold on to the dress a lot longer than they hold on to the husband. But, you know, that's such an important thing. But it's also like, you know, I have a Culture Club t-shirt, you know, and I waited forever. I saw Culture Club many times, but was never able to get a t-shirt. And so, you know, it's really important to me. But I also think, I said, you know, birthdays in November, a friend of mine bought me a copy was a vintage, it was also vintage, a copy of my favorite sweater in high school. You know, and that's what she gave me for my birthday this year. So we have these memories in our lives that are so important and we can almost always remember what we wear, you know? And when we stop and we respect that, that those clothes are part of the memory, then we want to take care of them and hold on to them. I mean, in the show there, again, there's a gentleman who has his letterman jacket and when he puts it on, even now, I mean, you can see him kind of 
sort of swell up, you know, because he's so proud of what he had to do to get it. And you said your boys are in sports. So, you know, maybe they will have letter jackets or maybe they have jerseys that, you know, they won the game in. And those aren't just clothes. They're not. They're trophies and they're memories. And, you know, they're kind of like the adult version of a teddy bear. You know, when you're a kid, you have this teddy bear and, you know, it's just like so important to you. When you're an adult, you have these clothes and they're not just clothes. You know, it's the jacket you wore when you got that new job or it's the sweater you wore when you met your husband. You know, all of those things, I mean, the memories are tied up in them and that's a tangible reminder of those memories and you want to take care of them. And it gives you so much joy to be able to restore something that someone has decided is unwearable or trash even because of the stains or because of, you know, something that's happened to it. And then to be able to restore it back to a a condition where it can be worn again so more memories can be made in it. Share your, your most favorite memory or your experience of doing that for someone else. Well, I mean, I did it over and over on the show, but there's one on the show that when I look back, it's funny because when I did it, it was really important to me because they were all really important to me. But when I watched the episode, it, it does kind of stand out. There was a woman who had her mother's dress and her mother had made the dress to wear to her wedding, but with the intent that she could continue to wear the dress. And unfortunately, when she was six and a half, her mother died. And it was the only piece of apparel of her mother's that she had. And fortunately, somebody had thought to save it. And so, you know, she had this dress and it looked terrible. It was stained and wrinkled. And the reason that it's my favorite is because something she said in an interview that I didn't even see, she said, I feel like I let my mother down because I let the dress get into this shape. Mm. And that's a pretty heavy thought that you let down the person who probably loves you most on the earth, you know? And she said, I feel like I kind of let her down. And when I watch it, and then I know that I got the dress clean. And it was funny because the camera guys were all like fist bumping me and everybody was so excited because they had all seen her, you know, they had all interacted with her while I'm like washing the dress and I don't know any of this is going on. And you know, they were all so excited for this reveal. And when I showed it to her, she was just overwhelmed. And that happens a lot. You know, you can imagine that when I help somebody restore something, you know, they're kind of overwhelmed, but I didn't, I mean, I knew it meant a lot to her, but I didn't know it meant that much. And it makes me so happy that, you know, I can take a soap and a horsehair brush and bring that back to somebody, you know, no matter what it is, it, It's like a childhood toy. It's a baptismal gown. It's, you know, the pillowcases that your mom made. Um, I get stories all the time where somebody asks me to help them clean something and I do, and then I get the backstory. And and it's amazing. And it's just, you know, I mean, you want to say it's just a piece of cloth, but it's not just a piece of cloth. It's like the most important thing that somebody has. And I mean, you know, how can you not, how can you not love your life when you can do that for somebody, no matter what it is? Really restore the memories, restore in some ways, a little bit of that person and that day or that event is coming back just by cleaning something. Yeah. It's, I mean, you don't realize like you have the memories, you know, when the item is ruined, you look at it and you're like, Oh, that was my wedding dress, but you know, it's ruined. But when the item is clean and it's restored and it looks like it did before you wore it, you know, when your grandmother made it, or it looks like the pillowcases did when they were, you know, on the bed when you were a kid, it really does change the memory. I mean, to use the phrase that flips the script, it kind of does, it puts it back. Like it brings you back to that moment. You know, when you see all the stains on it, it's like it's 2021, but when all the stains are gone, it's 1976 again. And that's really powerful. And you just don't realize how important it is that it looked like it did when you were a kid or whatever the memory happens to be. And it is, it's really meaningful. And, you know, I mean, I'm really lucky. And you went to school to study apparel and textiles, but you can't Google 
how to do what you do. You figured that out. How did you figure it out? And how many things did you ruin in the process, frankly? I ruined one thing. I can tell you that right off. I ruined a pair of gold linen pants. And, you know, it's probably good that I don't still have them because I really loved them. And looking back on it, it probably wasn't the best color. Um, <laughs> but I loved them at the time. I wore, and they got too short. They they got short. Actually, now they would be very, you know, au courant because everybody's doing high waters. But You were on trend before that was a trend. Right. You know, I, I made... Maybe I started it. I just didn't know. But there we I go. ruined a pair. You should of, own that. Own right. that. You started that trend. Right. So I ruined a pair of gold linen trousers, washing them in the machine because I didn't know what to do. But it, it's funny because they're very important because that was when I was like, okay, there's no reason I can't wash linen because, you know, it's just linen. So what went wrong? And I figured it out. I mean, I, and that was probably one of the first things that I washed when I'm like, yeah, okay, you know, I can do this. And, you know, I was in college and had a college kid's budget, but I had this beautiful wardrobe because I loved to shop and my mom and grandmother loved to shop. And so I, you know, I had to figure out how to make it work. Otherwise I was going to have a closet full of clothes that I couldn't wear. And, you know, that's no fun, right? No. And then when I got out of college and I start, moved to actually, when I left college, I moved to Minneapolis and went to work for Neiman Marcus, which put me in front of like the best clothes in the world. But it's way more fun to buy something than it is to spend $45 to dry clean it. So I got really adventurous in washing, you know, because I just thought about like, you know, sheep live outside, you know, cashmere goats live on mountains. So all that stuff gets exposed to water. And so I just got really curious and I started playing and started testing and because of my textiles background, I knew enough to know what would go wrong, like what would happen. And, you know, a few times I figured out how to fix it, but a lot of times I just figured out hacks so that it wouldn't happen in the first place. And, you know, I, I tell people, you know, all you have to do is believe. You just have to believe you can do it and you can do it. And that's kind of what I did. I just got curious and, you know, played with it and figured it out. And I still do that. You know, I still, I hear about new technologies and new things. And I'm still curious, you know, I still try to learn more, still try new things, still periodically, you know, borrow a lab and go in and see what's going to happen. Fascinating. When was the last time you took something to the dry cleaner? Over 12 years ago, but I don't like, you know, it's not like I, I kind of wish that I had, you know, the very last thing I ever dry cleaned, but I know it's over 12 years ago. And if, for people who aren't familiar with, with you and your work, you're not sitting around wearing sweats. I mean, you wear fabrics that the rest of us think have to go to the dry cleaner. You have just figured out a way to launder them at home. Right. I mean, my favorite fabric on the planet is cashmere. I love cashmere. Like most people love chocolate. You know, I mean, when it gets cold, I wear cashmere overcoats. I wear cashmere sweaters. You know, I have a, like a cashmere felt shirt. I mean, I love cashmere. I wear it all the time and I wear suits, you know, i I have a tuxedo. I haven't gotten to wear it in a couple of years, but last fall, you know, I was really hopeful. So I washed it so that it would be ready. So, you know, I don't sit around in active wear, you know, and if you invite me to your wedding, I'm not going to show up in a t-shirt and jeans. <laughs> Good to know. Noted. Yeah. I, since I've been married 25 years, I hope that isn't the invitation you get for me, but there are other things that could be mm -hmm. dress up events where the tuxedo would be appropriate. Right. You have done some really interesting things to get clothes washed. And when I've, I've seen your stuff, the, the vodka in a spray bottle. How did you figure out that vodka in a spray bottle is something that should be in a laundry room and not in a bar? Or perhaps both, I imagine, is maybe the right answer to that question. But how did you figure out that would work? And what are we supposed to do with vodka in a spray bottle? Well, first, I'll tell you what you do. Vodka will remove the odor from anything. You can spray vodka on clothes that smell like cigarette smoke. They smell like the restaurant that you left. Maybe you got a little hot and sweaty. I mean, theaters use this trick on costumes. It's kind of an old trick, but the reason that it works is because of the way vodka is distilled. Lots of people know that vodka is completely odorless when it's dry. If you ask around, maybe your high school teacher had it in his desk drawer. 
because it's completely odorless when it dries. Well, it has this antibacterial property and it's odorless. So like, you know, in theory, gin would kill the odor on something, but gin isn't odorless. So vodka has these two properties that are both great. It's completely antibacterial and will kill the odor, but then it is also odorless. And that's what kind of makes it unique. And that's why you can use it in a spray bottle. And you use that on any fabric that needs it. It's oh, safe. Vod- totally. Vodka, you can spray on anything. I mean, I tell people, you know, keep a bottle in the desk drawer and a spray bottle so that if you smell like somebody's perfume, you can spray it. But spray it on the car seat. Spray it in sneakers. Spray it on the back seat of the car where, you know, the dog was on the sofa. I mean, you can spray it on anything and it will remove the odor. It's really an amazing trick. And I mean, how easy is that to put vodka in a, vodka in a spray bottle? Does it matter if you get the cheap stuff or is a potato vodka, like, is there a way to do vodka better in a spray bottle? There's not a way to do it better. I My joke is always to get college vodka. Get the cheapest vodka you can, as long as it's really vodka, and put it in a spray bottle and off you go. Just don't tell the college kids in your home. That's where it is. Fair enough. That's a secret between you and your laundry. Mm-hmm. So I think it's really fascinating that you've got to this position in your career and life doing something that you just love. It doesn't, I'm sure it doesn't feel like work. And you have talked several times about how it's a gift and, and how you're so fortunate to do what you do. Are you still surprised at now, if you went back and told your 20 year old or college age, cheap vodka drinking yourself, Hey, this is what you're going to do your whole life. Are you surprised you, you get to do this for a career? It's amazing. Although I didn't cheap, drink cheap vodka in college. Remember, I grew up in Kentucky, so we were bourbon people. Okay. But <laughs> good bourbon because I grew up in Kentucky. And you had linen pants on. You're not going to drink cheap bourbon. Well, <laughs> given that you're that close to bourbon, you know what's good bourbon. But anyway, if I think back, you know, if I think back to, you know, my 20s when I was in college, could I tell myself, you know, someday laundry is going to be a thing? No. I would never have known that because, you know, I would have listened more, but I mean, I'm so lucky that I was allowed to pursue my passion at a very early age, you know, that nobody thought it was weird that this little kid loves laundry. And I'm so lucky that when I went to college, I had professors who, who saw that I had passion and I didn't even know what the passion was. Right. I mean, I thought the passion was like European fashion because I was sure that that's what I was going to do as a career. And I guess in a weird way I do, I just wash it. But you know, the thing is they still sort of believed in me and they still just kind of let me do my thing. So when I wanted to look around the costume collection of Mona Bismarck, you know, who was Mona Williams, um, she left all of her clothes to the university of Kentucky. So I got to see them, but you know, while I didn't go study with Balenciaga, who most of those clothes were, what it did let me do, I mean, as I look back on it, I realized, you know, those were the most expensive fabrics in the world. I mean, it was said in 1933, she wouldn't have had to have spent $100,000 a year on clothes to be named best dressed woman in the world, implying that in 1933, she spent $100,000 a year on clothes. And she left her entire lifetime's wardrobe to the University of Kentucky. And I got to look at it and touch it. And my professors let me because I was so interested. Well, fast forward to me now, you know, I know those things were washable, you know? So those are things that most people never get to experience firsthand. And I kind of am like, well, if I could wash those, I could wash anything. So I think that, you know, I must've known something big was going to happen and I would ask the right questions, but as far as it being laundry, no, I wouldn't have guessed that. And how awesome is that? So it's this, you know, passion, figure out what you're passionate in, be curious. And you said something that a lot of our guests say, which is you had people around you who believed in you and who supported you. And if those people around you would have said, what do you, Santa's not bringing you a washing machine. You should be interested in clothes. Who knows where your life would have gone, but you had people around you who said, I'm going to support you because that is a really, obviously you love it. Obviously you're passionate about it and who knows where it might lead. And there isn't anything wrong. I guess there is, but illegal, maybe wrong to be interested in. Just follow that, follow the breadcrumb of where that could take you. What a gift. Right. And, you know, and I also think at some point in time, you just kind of have to decide that 
you're going to do what may, what you love, you know? I mean, when I left Nordstrom, what, 10 years ago, the story of opening the store is I was at Nordstrom for 10 years and I needed to leave and I left and I was going to go to New York to see the, the Scaparelli exhibit at the Metropolitan. And there was an article in the paper about like that just vintage stores were becoming a huge trend in New York. And I thought, oh, I should open a vintage store. And, you know, that was kind of the next step in my career path was to open a vintage store. And I carried the laundry product in one corner of the store because what is one of the number one qu- hesitations people have are, well, I'll just tell you, it's, I don't want to dry clean it. I'm not going to buy it because I don't want to dry clean it. And so I came up with a practical solution to, well, I'll just tell you how to wash it. So, you know, I can just take that right off the table. And so I started with this corner of laundry product in a store full of vintage. And if you come to my store now, it's a store full of cleaning with a corner full of vintage. So, you know, I think that sometimes you just, you have people that believe in you, but a lot of the time you just have to believe in yourself. I mean, it was a scary thing to go from, you know, a cushy job in a big store where, you know, everybody else did everything for you. And all you had to do was, you know, sell clothes and they took care of the insurance, you know, to go from that to, yeah, I can do this. I can open a vintage store. I've never opened one before, but I can take a class on how to open the store, which is what I did. And then I just, you know, I just kind of jumped in. I always say I ride without a helmet. You know, I just get on and go and I'll figure it out when I get there. And the name of your store, Mona Williams, which you talked about earlier, was it easy for you to know you were going to name your store after her or did you like have a whole list of things or was that like immediately I have to do this? No, it's funny. I wanted to name it after my granny and I was, that's what I was going to name it. And I realized like, it's going to be a business and I'm going to be a business owner. And I didn't know what my future would hold, but I knew that if I named it after her, I would never sell it because I would never be willing to sell her name. So I decided that I had to come up with a different tact and I thought, well, who else really influenced me? And I had a professor who did, who unfortunately passed away. And I thought about her, but quite frankly, her name doesn't just roll off your tongue. And then I thought, well, who else was a huge influence? And I was like, oh my gosh, it was Mona. And it's funny now people kind of know about her because, you know, Truman Capote wrote about her and like Truman's work is becoming a thing again. So people are reading about her and, you know, just with the internet, more people know about her. But when I opened the store, nobody knew who she was. You know, nobody knew who Mona was. But it's kind of a great name. And it was such a fun story that that's how it happened. Well, and it's so authentic to you and your journey, which is why it's special. If you'd have just opened Truman Capote you know, book and read about her and been like, there it is, it wouldn't have had the importance that it does to you because that's, a, that's an incredible story. And stories resonate with people and stories are in the clothes and it all comes together in a lovely, beautiful bow, doesn't it? A cashmere bow. A ca- you know what? All bows should be cashmere bows. Well, now that I know I can wash it, I might actually think about buying some more. Mm-hmm. You should the dry cleaning, the smell, ugh. And it's scratchy. And don't even get me started on the process. <laughs> so everyone, I'm, I met not everyone. I'm sure there are people listening like, okay, we got vodka in a spray bottle. Like, give me another tip. And what, I've seen stories where you've done the five tips, and we'll put that on the website. What is your number one tip? What do we all do wrong? You use too much detergent or soap. Stop. You know, Americans love more is more. And with soap or detergent, you know, I'm a fan of soap over detergent. But either way, you're using too much. More does not get your clothes cleaner. More actually makes your clothes dirtier. So, you know, cut back. And for heaven's sakes, skip the pods. You know, there's enough detergent in one pod to do five loads of laundry. So, you know, just use less. The biggest thing you do wrong is use too much. Most people who use a Tide or something, a a brand like that, it comes with a little cap. You put it in the cap, you dump it in. Or if you're a rebel like me, you just dump it in and guess because who's got time for caps? So you're saying I should use a lot less than what's in the cap. A couple tablespoons, how much? If you're going to use, let's use the big orange, two tablespoons. And if you look at the cap, it's a half a cup for a full load, a fourth a cup for a small load. I'm telling you to use half of a fourth of a cup. So you're going to use an eighth of a cup. 
Well, isn't it weird that a big brand would tell us to use more than we need so that we have to buy more? That is so weird. I know. I mean, who would think that they were putting profit over what was best for you? And my cashmere bows, cashmere bows. But we shouldn't be using the big orange. We should be using laundry chips, right? I prefer soap. I am a huge proponent of soap. Soap rinse is completely clean. It has no residue. Detergents often have a residue. And when we think back to the Victorians who did wash everything because they didn't have dry cleaners, right? They used soap because detergent wasn't available. I'm a big fan of soap because I think it's so much more gentle and it rinses completely clean. Is there a brand you recommend? Well, I mean, I the reality is, that, it's your brand. well, the reality is I had one formulated because I yeah. couldn't find exactly what I wanted, but you know, so obviously the one I recommend is mine, right? Yeah. But there are other soap brands on the market and any soap brand, any laundry soap is going to be better than any laundry detergent. So whatever soap brand you find, it's going to be better than any detergent you can find. Your soap brand, people can find it in your store in the Mall of America or online. Correct. It's at laundryevangelist.com. Great. When you think about the delicates and the special kind of fabrics and the way that you talk about it, I think about people who say, you know, don't save your china. Don't save your china for the one time a year that you're going to have a party and P.S. COVID is going to happen and that china just sits around and no one is using it. Meanwhile, your family is using garbage. Use the china all the time. And that's how you, I think, talk about clothes is don't just wear the cashmere for the one thing. Use it all the time because if you feel good on it, in it, and if it's beautiful and it makes you happy and you want to make memories in it, wear the cashmere. Do you have to tell people that a lot? Like, don't save that stuff. Wear it. I have to tell people that all the time, all the time. I always use the example that I will put my tuxedo jacket on with jeans and a t-shirt. You know, if I'm going someplace and I think it's the right look, I will wear it. I'm not afraid, but all the time I'm like, look, we can fix this no matter what it is. So you bought that killer party dress because you went to a wedding and you're saving it. Well, quite frankly, by the time you find another event, it's either going to be out of style. It's going to be a different size than you are. Or you're going to want something new. So put it on, you know, wear it to the grocery store. When I sold designer clothes, that's what I always said. When somebody said, well, I don't have no idea where I'd wear that. And I'd be like, well, wear it to Cub. It'll feel like you're going to Byerly's. <laughs> and, you know, it's just put it on. Like, just put it on and wear it. And I think that that, I think that you become so liberated when you have just a one closet, you know, you don't have work clothes and play clothes and party clothes. You just have one closet and you just reach in and pull out what you want and you wear it. I think it's a lot more fun. And you feel better. Yeah, in you general. feel great because you're wearing something that you look great in. I mean, you know, think of the, how long you searched for that dress, you know, to wear to your best friend's wedding or something. Because you knew you looked amazing. Why don't you want to feel amazing on Thursday, not just at a wedding? That's great. It's just such a, I mean, all of this, all the things you talk about are, are really a mindset shift. And it's just changes your whole outlook when you feel better, you act better, you look better, you smile to a stranger, you, that stranger feels better. I mean, really, you're just making the world a better place, Patrick. That's what you do. <laughs> I don't know. But I'm not, I'm not willing to go that far. But <laughs> I am going to say something else about mindset shift. Because I think that's a big thing. I mean, it's something that I could say over and over. It's about laundry. I mean, you know, going back to the beginning when you were, you know, people hate to do laundry. When I was a kid, based on looking at you, I'm assuming it was long before you were born. But when I was a kid, you would watch TV shows and it would primarily be the mother in the show because, you know, that was the times who would be like, oh, I have to go home and make dinner for the kids. And it was like this huge chore to go home and make dinner. Well, my mom put the chicken in the oven in 1977, the exact same way that Ina Garten puts the chicken in the oven in 2021. And in 2021, we have networks and magazines and books, you know, book and cookbooks are the number one book category, all devoted to cooking and cooking has become this huge hobby. I mean, there are stores, you know, there are stores all over the Twin Cities that are just devoted to cooking. 
And it's the exact same way my mom did it in the 70s. The only thing that happened is somebody decided that cooking wasn't a chore, cooking was a hobby. That's it. That is literally the only thing that happened is somebody was like, I don't have to put the chicken in the oven. I get to put the chicken in the oven. So all you have to do to take laundry from being this thing you hate into being this thing that you love is decide that you love it. It's really not that hard. And add a disco ball because then it's just more fun. And put on a cashmere bow and a tuxedo jacket and it's a party. Right. I mean, you know, take a cocktail and go to the laundry room and have fun. And keep the vodka in the spray bottle and go to the bar if you need actual vodka. Exactly. Oh, we learned so much today. What's next for you? You had the show, your book, you have the store. Can you tell us or is it a secret? We just need to pay attention to your social. (laughs) Well, watch my social. I'm working on another book. To be honest, I'm just looking forward to like, you know, taking a breather. I just want people to be able to come in the store and actually see me and be able to ask me their laundry questions. So, you know, working on a book, hanging in the store, washing clothes. With a disco ball going. Always. with a, Why wouldn't you have a disco ball? I think everybody should have a disco ball. I think it's a law. I like this law. I like this mm-hmm. law. Elections mm-hmm. are coming. You could maybe run. Right. Well, I think it's, yeah. So next time through, maybe. I'll have more <laughs> free time then. <laughs> What's the number one question you get in the store? Number one question I get in the store is, are you sure I can really wash it? The number two question is, what can I do instead of dryer sheets? Because, you know, I'm famous for hating dryer sheets and fabric softener. And, you know, it's funny because it's you take a one yard piece of aluminum foil, make it into a ball about the size of the tennis ball, throw it in your dryer, and it will absorb static better than anything you've ever done in your life. Look at that tip. All right, everybody, you got all sorts of tips. If you're listening, not for the story, but for the tips, you got both. You're welcome. Patrick, what a pleasure to talk with you. I can't wait to see what you do next. We end the episode like we do all episodes. Is there a quote or lyric or something that has helped you as you've changed the world and how we think about laundry? Well, it's funny. Knowing that this question was coming, I'm going to give you the the true honest answer. I actually have a playlist. When I need motivation myself, I have a playlist and I'm just going to pull it. I'm going to pull a couple of songs from it and give you the words and give you the lyrics. So give me two secs. So if you're listening at home and it's safe, turn your disco ball on. Now's the time. Exactly. So, you know, I should share this playlist and then you could share it. Um, Yes, let's do that. Yeah, that'd be fun. But one of the ones that I always go to is This Is It from Kenny Loggins. Ooh, 80s, right? 80s? Love it. You know, totally. But, you know, child of the 80s. But I love it because, you know, it's like, you know, it's kind of like now. I, all of these songs, the thing they're all going to have in common is, you know, it's time for now. Like, you can't put your, you can't put things off. You just have to go. And um, the one that I have to go with, I'm going to, I'll give you the whole playlist. But I'm still standing from Elton John because, you know, we need to do that. Local guy who falls into my list, um, The End Is Not The End from Mark Mallman, because, you know, the end is not the end. You just have to reinvent, you know, when things go wrong. You haven't seen the last of me from Cher. I guess all of these probably happened when I was opening the store. Seasons of Love and Seasons of Love, there's a funny reason for it. It's not because of the song. It's because there's 525,600 minutes. And I was listening to the song and realized that everybody has 525,600 minutes. So you can be Helen Keller and become incredible. Or you can sit on the couch and nobody knows who you are. So it isn't really the song. It was the fact that it's 525,600 minutes and everybody has the same amount of time and you just decide what you do with them. Something more from Sugarland, which is, you know, there's got to be something more. There's got to be more than this, which came up when I was leaving Nordstrom. And that was very pivotal in my life. Like I just needed more, you know, I needed more for me. And I listened to that song over and over then. Thank you to the CD because that was before Spotify. This is your life. It's a song that nobody's going to know what it is. It's from a group called the Banderas. And the lyrics are, you know, this isn't, this is not a story. This is not a book. This is your life. And you have to stop and think about that. Like I think about, you know, this isn't, well, in my case now, I guess it is a book, but it's my life. Like I have to live it and I get to do whatever I want. And then 
my final one, because if I have to give one, this is it. So if you edit everything out, go ahead. But it's Gold, which is from Spando Ballet. And I love this song because it kind of works no matter what. And I actually pulled the quote. So. And we are not editing that out because no one has ever shared a playlist. And that playlist is fantastic. I'm putting it on my own phone and people are going to love it just to hear the playlist. Well, I love these because, you know, I mean, I still listen to it. And that's the reason I have it, you know, as a playlist. But it, it, we're going to end with Spando Ballet because we got to go back to the 80s. But the lyrics are, you know, always believe in your soul. You've got the power to know you're indestructible. And if you're going to remember anything, you should remember to always believe in your soul. You've got the power to know you're indestructible. So if you're going to become the laundry guy or you're going to become the cleaning queen or whatever you're going to do, you're going to do it because you believe in yourself and you've got to know that you're indestructible. What a way to end. Thank you so much for sharing your story, your playlist and all your laundry tips. Well, thank you so much for having me. This was so so, so much fun. So, you know, when I do book two, I'm going to ask to come back. Please. We, you have an open invitation here. And I just want to end with a, a, a sort of a wrap up of the, all the things that Patrick said. Wear the cashmere, eat off the china, drink the good wine, install the disco ball you only live once. My hope is Patrick's story empowers you to believe you're capable of more than you think, to discover motivation, to uncover inspiration, and to find the strength to turn the page. Thank you for listening to Flip Your Script, hosted by Christy Peel and produced by Media Minefield. If you like our message, please be sure to give us a five-star rating, subscribe to the show, and share our episodes with your family and friends. Do you or someone you know have a story about flipping your script? We'd love to share it. Contact us on our website, flipyourscriptpodcast.com. To stay up to date on all things Flip Your Script, make sure to follow host Christy Peel on social media. You can also check out the website for pictures, resources mentioned in the show, and other great episodes.